Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to share my research uh, with your audience. Um, I can start by talking about my background. My background is fluid dynamics and computational engineering. And as mentioned, I actually graduated a PhD from the Department of Mechanical Engineering here. And particularly in fluid dynamics, the problems that I work on are problems where the key engineering questions are uh, about mass transport. You want to know where objects go or where ions go. And to be able to answer those questions, you need to often analyze situations where mass transport is coupled with complex hydrodynamic phenomena. And so you need to analyze mass transport coupled with, uh, with fluid dynamics. So I have two mini stories, basically two puzzles that I want to share with you. Uh, one of them addresses this question or is about the question, how can you utilize particle laden fluids for harvesting solar energy? Basically, how can you use a dusty gas to absorb sunlight? And then the second question is about how electrochemical systems can trigger complex fluid dynamic phenomena. So one common theme between these problems is that experimentally you cannot answer all of the detailed you know, effects that happen in these things. And to be inspired and to understand what is going on, you need to use very complicated calculations to understand these. But the more important theme is that after you see those complex simulations, how can you come back and say something simple? something useful for engineers, something useful for designers. And hopefully I could emphasize those simple things more than the complicated things. Okay, so here I am just motivating the first problem. Uh, you are all familiar with solar fields, basically mirrors that get sunlight and then they focus the sunlight in a, in a confined area. And uh, these are commercially existing, including California. And then the, the objective is typically to use that focused sunlight to heat material, often gases. Uh, for example, in a chemical plant, or, uh, or you may want to do this uh, for, for another step of energy conversion. So today technology is schematically shown here. Uh, you, you get focused sunlight, and then you first heat a solid surface with it that has very good absorption property. And then you heat a gas conductively. So the sunlight radiation is absorbed by the solid surface, then conductively moves to a gas. And then the problem with that method is that if you want to have you know, high temperatures, let's say, for example, 1,000 degrees for a fast moving flow, the surface itself has to be even hotter, like, for example, 2,000 degrees. And so the re-radiation loss due to this hotter surface is actually a loss. So you, you want to avoid that. And so a better concept that we are working on is that we allow the focused sunlight to come in and then we want it to uniformly heat the gas. Therefore, all of the temperature is going to be 1,000 degrees and then there is no high temperature object that could re-radiate back. So that's the, that's the thinking behind this concept. So the problem is that most gases are transparent. So in order to absorb sunlight, you need to put things in the fluid to absorb it. And so the concept that we're working on is utilizing dusty fluids. They are opaque and they can absorb sunlight. So there is a group of faculty working with me on this problem. In fact, Gianluca Iacorino is the director of that program called the PSAP program. Uh, but I want to share with you a simple physics story about this concept. Let's think of the simplest setting, right? Imagine a box of fluid and initially, the velocity of the fluid is zero. There is no flow, in fact, in this simplest setting. And then I'm going to seed this box with particles uniformly, right? So that is my dusty fluid. And if I don't do anything, nothing happens. Just the dust is going to settle very slowly at, over a very long time. But nothing happens. No flow, nothing. Then I will start radiating this box. And we have simulated such a setting for the first time. And, and I'm going to sh share with you the result of that uh, simulation. So now I hit this box by a focused sunlight and you can see what is going to happen. It turns out you would get particle clustering and as a result of that you would get huge temperature fluctuations. Some regions in this gas remain cold and some regions become very hot. And the simple reason behind this is that as each particle gets hot it makes the fluid around it hot and so you get a buoyancy driven flow and you get generation of vorticity in this flow. And then that centrifuges out the particles, and so particles would escape from 
uh, vortex zones and then they accumulate in, in other zones in, in terms of these filaments that you see here. And so that defeats the initial purpose that we have. So we, we wrote a paper about this and we said how this phenomena works out. Basically the, the first fascinating thing is that if you, if you radiate a dusty fluid, it can generate turbulence and people didn't know that before. Uh, and simple questions such as if I double the size of the box, if I double the particle numbers, how does that turbulence going to behave? So those are, those are the questions that we have worked on. But I want to say something simpler that would help us address this issue. So it turns out I don't get uniform temperature, but I want to get uniform temperature. And in order to do that, I want to make my particle distribution to be uniform. And to do that, we, we analyze something which is even simpler. Instead of turbulence, think of a flow field which is a straining flow, right? Here I have shown the streamlines. But then it is a straining flow that oscillates. It does something like this. And then this is something that you can solve in pen and paper. You can analyze this in pen and paper. And that could be a localized experience of turbulence for particles. That's basically how we were inspired to, to look at this problem. Now I put particles in that flow and I look at its behavior. And you can see that as the flow oscillates, particles gradually cluster. They accumulate at the center. And so that explains how, how this phenomena happens. Now, we can change the amplitude of this flow and change the frequency to represent different range of experiences that particles can have in a given turbulent flow. Tur turbulent flow has wide range of frequencies and has one wide range of amplitudes. And alternatively, we can look at these modes and instead of one set of particles, I can have two sets of particles, like red and black, like what is shown here. They are, they are particles that are initially uh, together, but then red is, let's say, a little bit heavier than the black. And let's see what is going to be the experience of particles in this time. It's a different, different flow. And you can see that one set of particles is actually going to cluster, as you saw there. But then the other set, it's going to mix and spread around. And it turns out we can solve this problem with pen and paper, explain how this is going to happen. And so this generates insights, how I can go back to my solar receiver problem and think about how I can put particles at different sizes. So in regions that one set of particle clusters, then the other set of particles is actually going to uniformly distribute. And so the turbulence is a little bit complicated. I have many of these situations with different frequencies and different modes. But that is the thinking that goes into our research, how we can Utilize the simple learning to optimize a solar receiver. Okay, that was my first mini story. I'm going to transition to the second one. And this is about complex phenomena that happens in, in electrochemical systems. This is just a motivation slide. Um, basically, I'm going to introduce you a phenomena that is broadly relevant to electrochemical systems. Any setting in which you have fluid, and in that fluid you have ions, and you want to push the ions to be absorbed by an interface by applying a voltage. And then I will tell you, in a lot of those scenarios, you would, you would invoke comp complex hydrodynamics. But I'm going to just focus on one application, and that is, that is electrodialysis for, for desalination. So this is a desalination system uh, uh, commercially available. And what is inside this is, are many channels, many long and thin channels, and then you would bring salty water in. And the idea is that you want, by the time that the water goes out, you want to take all of the ions or the salt out. So here, plus is, let's say, sodium ion, minus is chlorine ion. And by applying a voltage, you apply an electric field. And the idea is that as the flow goes through, you can extract the ions. And if you make, so this is a movie concept of the same thing. If I make this channel long enough, by the exit, I can have 99% of our ions taken out. So this is an engineering system that is being built and designed today. Usually people put these in a stack, uh, and, and uh, basically there are interfaces of membranes where these membranes allow ions to go in one direction and not in the other direction. And, and so you will have a, a, a one in a row array of these where one channel becomes less salty and then another channel collects the salt. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Uh, I'm just going to tell you what is the most important engineering question in these systems. And that is, for a given voltage that one applies, what is the rate that I can take the salt out? And that is one of the measurements of such, such questions. Uh, you apply a voltage, you increase the voltage, you would drive the ions faster, therefore you take the salt out uh, faster. And then in, there is a regime where as you increase the voltage, you don't get much more salt out. 
And this regime was explained by theories before, but then people who did experiments, they observed that after they go through this regime, there is a new regime where increasing voltage gives them higher desalination rate. And this was not explained. There was no, um, thank you. There was no explanation why, why this happens like that. So this is what we did. We said, let's simplify the problem. Let's forget about imposed flow. Let's think of just one membrane, one of these chambers, one of those interfaces. Um, and let's just consider two types of ions, sodium and chloride and in a fluid and applied voltage. And let's think of this setting. The equations governing this system are known for many decades. Specifically, we look at equations that look at transport of ions in a fluid and equations that talk about momentum, uh, Navier-Stokes equations, including electrostatic body forces due to ions, and then Poisson equations that tells me for a given composition of ions, what is the electric field. And this is what we got, right? So you get a chaotic phenomena just by forcing ions with a voltage to go through an interface. Here, what I have shown is basically my domain, the membrane that is supposed to absorb the ions is here, and then the color shows the salt concentration. White is high salinity fluid, and dark means desalinated fluid. And you can see that the, these are mixed in a, in a highly chaotic and turbulent way. In fact, this length scale in our calculations is of order 10 microns. And if you look at the smallest turbulent structures, that are of order below 100 nanometers. So that, that is the thing that you need to resolve. And experimentally, you don't have access to those length scales. And so what happens out of seeing this movie is that you would get Basically, due to this hydrodynamic instability, you would get a finger of salty fluid from top, and that is brought down to the mem membrane very fast. And then the membrane can absorb the salt out of that fluid. And that explains why, after you go to higher voltage, you get higher desalination rate. So that explains the puzzle that way. I go to the engineering question again. The diagram, this, the, the rate of desalination as a function of voltage. This was the previous theory. And then it turns out when we did our simulations, we showed that actually the data is on top of the experiment. And so that explained what is going on. So now having this vision, having this knowledge, we were able to actually come up with ideas for improving these systems. For example, this is a three-dimensional simulation of the same thing. Um, and here I'm showing the membrane surface. Again, white means salty fluid. And if you look at it, you, you can see that at a given time, you don't have much salt next to membrane. That means actually most of your membrane is not desalinating anything. Like 85% of your membrane surface is not doing anything. Only 15% is, is next to salt, so it can take the salt out. So we analyzed this data, you spending a lot of time, and then we came up with a concept to improve this. We said, well, let's compare two scenarios. The traditional scenario where you have a homogeneous membrane versus a scenario where now we have blocked the membrane at a, at a specific wavelength. And now I'm going to run these two simulations together. You see the old chaotic behavior, as I showed before in this case. And here you can see that it's highly regularized. And as a result of that regularization, you can run the flow faster, and you can bring the salt next to the membrane in a faster fashion. And it turns out with this situation, you can desalinate your fluid twice faster as this situation. That is highly unintuitive. Basically, what we proposed was that let's block the permeation area, and let's get the ions out faster. That would be like, if a panic situation happens in this room, there are many doors around, and I'd say, I have an idea. Let's close half of the doors, and we can go out faster, right? But that all comes out uh, uh, as a result of just the understanding of the chaos and understanding of what is going on in this system. So with that, I am done with my stories. Uh, these are the papers that share those stories in more quantitative details, and in, if, if you want to read them. and. Um, well, I'm done. I will be happy to answer questions or whatever you recommend. Will you be around afterwards? So we can... uh, hopefully you can stick around and answer some uh, yeah, questions. Yeah, I can make myself available. Thank that you. That would be great. Thank you so much. <laughs>